Muchas gracias. Eh, a continuación, después de estas dos presentaciones de Ramón y de Ron, que nos han situado en la visión de conjunto de, de las vidas de Torroja y Polivska, eh, doctor, profesor asociado de la Universidad de, de Berna, eh, Ladislav, eh, nos va a presentar una visión de conjunto, no solamente de estos dos insignes ingenieros, sino del resto de personalidades que rodearon a la ingeniería y a la arquitectura de su tiempo. El título seleccionado para esta ponencia, esta última ponencia de la mañana, será Filósofos de las estructuras. Y se hace alusión explícita a Polifka, Wright, Eduardo Torroja y, y otros filósofos de estas estructuras. Ladislav. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Ladislav Jackson, and um, I've been researching Yaroslav Polivka for quite, quite some time, for, for since, nine, since 2016, so for uh, almost seven years. And uh, that's probably the reason why I'm here. So thank you very much for organizing this spectacular event. And uh, of course, thanks to Ron and also his other Uh, other uh, cousins and sister to to um, working on his on, on their grandfather's legacy and donating these uh, archival documents to these archives, which we, I will discuss later. And uh, of course, thanks Aria and Miguel and uh, Isabel for for a wonderful care that they provide for these documents here, especially in Madrid. So. Thanks for that, and thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm not trying to bore you for a very long time. I will try to fit in those 45 minutes window, although I have a lot to talk about. Um, so in my talk, uh, I will pick up where Ron left off. Uh, I will start in 1940, when he, actually 1939, when he moved to the West Coast. Uh, of the United States, and uh, I will go um, a little bit further into uh, what he did during the war and after the war. So I will be discussing the last 20 years, which were very fruitful and very, very, he was very active and very productive in all kinds of various areas, uh, which is even incredible to me how he could be so productive at, you know, a little bit later age. Uh, doing all that stuff and writing all those letters and doing all those designs and inventions and calculations. Um, so that's the first objective, to present his last 20 years and what he did and his work. And uh, another objective is to sort of bring home those two lectures that we just uh, heard, Ramon's uh, amazing lecture and uh, Ron's uh, beautiful lecture about the first half of his life and sort of put them together and make some sense of it, uh, what was happening between Toroja and Jaroslav Polivka. I will be mentioning a lot of names. There will be a lot of kind of diversions, but please bear with me and hopefully in the end it will all make sense. I will try my best. Um, In 2021, I did a show on Yaroslav Polivka's life and work, both in Europe and in California, uh, which I called the philosopher of structures, uh, philosopher of structures, because that's how he considered himself, and that's what he wrote to Taroha, that he considers himself to be a philosopher of structures. Uh, so I did this, like this show. The first one was in Brno, and then there was another uh, version of it in Prague. And as a part of these um, of these shows, I had this wall which was supposed to signify some of the relationships that uh, Yaroslav Polivka and Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright had. In, on the left side, those are relationships that he maintained in Europe, and on the right side, those are relationships that he maintained uh, in the United States. So during our talk today, I will focus on just a very small section of it, which is 
almost like right here. So we will talk about only this part of the relationship network. And of course, I will bring more people into it. Um, I would also like to start with the sort of an explanation of what is happening in the poster for this event. Uh, so we don't really have any picture of Eduardo Toroja and uh, Jaroslav Polivka together because Jaroslav Polivka was the one who was taking the pictures all the time. Um, I made a joke yesterday that uh, if he lived nowadays and uh, he was introduced to Instagram, I think he would love it because he took so many pictures, uh, which is good for us as historians because we have all the visual documentation. Uh, so this is a very rare picture of Jaroslav Polivka in Italias in West in 1957, where he's pointing at a project of Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High Building, which was a spectacular project. He, it was really supposed to be a mile high building, uh, which was supposed to be like a city, entire city in one skyscraper structure. And he's pointing here. So Eduardo Toroja in the poster, I guess you got the part that he got photoshopped in the picture. He wasn't there uh, in the poster, but he is pointing at his name that is mentioned here in the in the credits. And what is mentioned there is salutations. So previously, uh, it was considered that he was some part of, some sort of part of the project. Uh, now I don't really think so, or he might have provided some advices to, to Frank Lloyd Wright, but we don't really have any correspondence or any designs or calculations that would suggest that he actually worked on this specific project. But there are salutations, salutations to Eduardo Toroja, uh, salutations to professors Bex Cross, who were at that time who were professors at Princeton University, and they were in touch with Frank Lloyd Wright. Then we already heard about Pierre Luigi Nervi, who was also in touch with Frank Lloyd Wright and Eduardo Toroja, and also he knew uh, Jaroslav Polivka, or more better way to put it, Jaroslav Polivka knew knew Nervi. And then there is my Mylard, who was a, a Switzerland engineer. So these are, these are these three people. Uh, so he only didn't know George E. Bex uh, because he passed away, I believe, in 1936. So he couldn't meet him in the United States. But he knew uh, Jaroslav Polivka knew Pierre Luigi Nervi, and he already knew Robert Mylar from the Switzerland when he where he was practicing between 1913 to 1916. Um, but I'm not going to talk about these people. I'm going to talk about these people. Uh, this is Jaroslav Polivka from a picture taken in 1950s when he was, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a picture taken probably in 1950 when he joined the Stanford University. Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about Frank Lloyd Wright and Eduardo Toroja, and I'm going to add some more people into the mix. For example, Victor de Suvero, who was a very interesting person that uh, Jaroslav Polivka got to, knew, got to know in 1940. Paolo Celazzi, also another interesting, and he was actual, an actual Italian engineer who also worked with Frank Lloyd Wright and Jaroslav Polivka on a certain project, and Elizabeth Kendall Thompson. Um, Ramon already briefly mentioned her name, so I'm going to explain what her role was in the, in the whole process. So this is the content, uh, this is the outline what I'm going to talk about. So first I'm going to very briefly introduce Jaroslav's very uh, fru fruitful and variable career uh, between 1940 to 1960. And then I'm going to focus on these relationships between Jaroslav Polivka and Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright and Eduardo Toroja, Jaroslav Polivka and Eduardo Toroja, and then I'm going to discuss, of course, the book and the preparation and the very long process of the preparation of the book of the philosophy of structures. If there are any academics uh, sitting here among us, uh, if you prepare a book for um, for almost 13 years, then you would probably get crazy. I, would, I definitely would. Uh, so Jaroslav Polivka continued building a lot of structures and a lot of private commissions in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, for example, here we have already seen this this uh, family house of his son Milos and and Ron and, and sister Kay. 
Uh, this was Jaroslav Polívka's own family house, which uh, he acquired a very small one-story uh, building in a Spanish style, and he enhanced it, and he, he put many additions to it over the, over the years. Uh, so this was his, his, this was his house. Then he cooperated with some Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentices who just moved to the San Francisco Bay Area on this beautiful and very unusual structure. And uh, this is uh, more like a mid-century modernist house house in Carmel. Then he also built churches. As far as I know, he built, he built four churches in the, in the entire San Francisco Bay Area. I know I can locate only two of them, uh, or I think that only two of them are still standing, which is Chinese Methodist Church in Oakland, which I'm going to mention twice more during the talk, and then there is this um, Richmond, uh, there is this uh, church in, in Richmond. Um, in the northern part of the Bay Area. And of course, he uh, did some industrial structures, mostly, uh, mostly some silos or some factories and uh, storage spaces. So these are some of them. Uh, three of them are in, uh, where, where in San Francisco Bay Area. This one was actually a wine storage or alcohol storage for Mexico City. Uh, but then, uh, at that time, in 1940s and 1950s, he also worked on some inventions, uh, and he wanted to get them patented. He wanted to get patents for at least four different projects with four different people, uh, and one of them was Victor de Suvero. Victor de Suvero was, uh, his story is kind of fascinating because he was born Italian, and in 1930s, or in, in, I think it was at the end of 1920s, he moved to China and he was serving in diplomatic services on behalf of Italy in China. But then in 1941, I believe when the occupation of Shanghai happened, then he had to move, so he fled to San Francisco Bay Area, and that's how he met Jaroslav Polivka. He wasn't an engineer, as far as I know, uh, but uh, he was quite very interesting and Renaissance man. He was more like an artist, but he was interested in structures. So together, they came up with this sort of crazy idea that they will straighten the leaning tower in Pisa. And they actually wanted to get it patented. They were quite very serious about that, so they uh, wanted to get it patented. And they actually uh, hired some people or contacted some people in Italy, like Bruno Zevi and uh, Giorgio Neumann, which I will again mention later, to promote this idea that they will actually that they will be their advocates in Italy to actually do that. So here, this is Victor de Suvero's drawing of Jaroslav Polivka with the Leaning Tower in Pisa. And this is actually a picture of Jaroslav Polivka with the, with the model of the, of the Leaning Tower in Pisa. But they started with this invention. This was uh, actually, in, at that time, uh, in 1940s, uh, there was a huge fright that uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco uh, will collapse, like the Tacoma, Tower, uh, like the Tacoma Bridge in, in the Seattle area. Uh, and uh, it was swinging in the wind a lot. So they wanted to fix the span, uh, suspended construction of the Golden Gate Bridge with adding more supports to, to, the, to, the, to the structure, which was kind of refused because it's not really that aesthetical like the monumental Golden Gate Bridge and elegant like the Golden Gate Bridge. But actually, they worked on it for some time and uh, actually uh, they uh, worked on, work on it for like 15, 15 more years. Then in 1940, in 1940 uh, Jaroslav Polivka met Paolo Celazi. Paolo Celazi was also an Italian who moved to China, uh, coincidentally. And uh, he, but he was a structural engineer and he saw opportunities in China because China in 1930s was developing in a very fast uh, way. And uh, Paolo Chalazi was not that lucky at, as Victor de Suvero because he got captured when Shanghai, Shanghai got occupied uh, by the Japanese army in 1941. And he got, actually got sent into the concentration camp which was one of, one of the most horrible concentration camps in Shanghai at that time. And when he was released in 1945, uh, he contacted Jaroslav Polivka that he wants to move to San Francisco Bay Area and if Jaroslav Polivka could s secure a job for him. Uh, but he, he was actually working again on these suspended constructions of hangars, 
for airplanes because it was the war time, but then after the war, it was just supposed to be any suspended construction. So Yaroslav Polivka put these two inventions together, the invention for the Golden Gate Bridge, which he did with Viktor de Suvero, and uh, the invention uh, for the hangars with the suspended construction that he did with Paolo Celazzi, and they were actually successful. They got it patented in 1957, and he used it when, he, when Frank Lloyd Wright asked him to design the suspended construction of the racetrack pavilion in New York City in the Belmont Park, which is one of the last projects uh, of Frank Lloyd Wright. So these two inventions, and actually Paolo Chalazzi was invited to work with uh, Yaroslav Polivka on this, on this project, or actually to, to, to at least advise with the project. So in 1939, Yaroslav Polivka got invited to give a lecture at UC Berkeley, and uh, everybody was so impressed that they uh, actually wanted to hire him. But it was a problem because uh, Yaroslav Polivka didn't actually have a working permit because he was, uh, he was, um, he was uh, uh, on, on just exile visa. So he actually worked for uh, the laboratories that were uh, led by Raymond e. Davis and there was a photoelasticity uh, laboratory that was led by Howard Eberhardt for more than a year for free. Um, by the time, of course, he, need to, he needed to get some money, and uh, the hiring process in, at UC Berkeley was quite complicated. So at the time, he also started to work for Kaiser Industries. Kaiser Industries uh, built huge docks for warships in Richmond area, in San Francisco Bay area, in, in Richmond docks, uh, where they started to assemble the ships from uh, pre-made pre -made parts, pre-made particles. So this typization, of course, fastened the process of building the warships. Uh, and Yaroslav Polivka was part of their engineering team uh, working on that. This is from the newsletter of the Kaiser Industries uh, highlighting Frank, uh, Yaroslav Polivka's achievements with, with Kaiser Industries. You can see Yaroslav Polivka here. Uh, so that's what he did during the war, and of course it was his way to fight the Nazis. Uh, they didn't know what was happening in Czechoslovakia to his fa wife's family at that time. They didn't know that they were murdered in the concentration camps by the Nazis. Uh, they learned after the war. Uh, but of course he knew that the Nazis are bad and that he needs to fight them somehow. So that was a way to, to fight uh, what was happening in the world. In 1950, uh, his academic career shifted, and he uh, actually got hired by Victor K. Thompson, uh, who was uh, head of the architectural department at Stanford University, to teach at Stanford University. Uh, he was teaching one course. Uh, he was teaching a course on structural design and structural engineering, which was just uh, which, which was like a survey in different all kind of different construction methods. And uh, while he was doing that, he already was using Frank Lloyd, uh, Eduardo Torroja's structures as examples that are supposed to be uh, that are supposed to be studied by the students at Stanford University. So you can see this is the syllabus, which was very thorough. I would never have time to write a syllabus exten extensive like that, which was very thorough. It had like it had like 20 pages, and of, uh, also it had images, and one of the images uh, was uh, uh, Eduardo Torroja's uh, structure. Uh, at the time, uh, as Ron uh, briefly mentioned, uh, at the time his son Milos was actually finishing or working on his Master uh, of Engineering degree at UC Berkeley, and uh, they actually worked, worked together on a different project, uh, because Yaroslav Polivka was also involved in chemical solidification method that you put some chemicals inside the soil and it solidifies the, the, the soil. Sorry, I'm an art historian, so I can't explain it any better. Um, so that's what they worked on, and then they were like, oh, so that might be a good topic, good research topic for Milos's thesis. So in 1948, Milos defended the thesis of chemical solidification of soil, and in 1949, because Yaroslav Polivka always wanted to apply uh, his theories and his research, so, in 1949, they actually got commissioned, both of them, uh, to, for chemical solidification of new pillars uh, within the Kaiser Stadium in San Francisco for uh, where the 49ers used to play, and it was kind of, kind of a big deal. 
Uh, Miloš Polívka also uh, got to meet Frank Lloyd Wright, and he made a good impression on Frank Lloyd Wright, and in 1958, right before Frank Lloyd Wright passed away, uh, he wrote this beautiful, lovely uh, note uh, for Miloš Polívka that he actually is a very competent young engineer. Back to Yaroslav Polívka and Frank Lloyd Wright. So how did they meet? In 1946, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright published an article uh, mostly about his experience while he was building the Falling Water Project. And of course, you probably know that the Falling Water Project uh, keeps falling apart since it was, big, uh, since it was built. Uh, so he was blaming the engineers. So he made some kind of a remark that, uh, but it wasn't that harsh, but he made a remark that engineers do not have much of an imagination. And Yaroslav Polivka felt offended, offended by that because he considered himself to be a philosopher of structures. Uh, so he wrote a very polite but very firm reaction to Frank Lloyd Wright that he actually thinks that some engineers are very competent and some of them have imagination. And then he mentioned that he loves uh, spider webs, that he loves observing spider webs inside the house. I don't know if Ron told me or, or, or one of his cousins told me that uh, his, uh, his their grandmother never uh, was, was kind of furious because he never wanted any spider web to be put down. So he was, he was loving the spider webs, which uh, apparently made an impression on Frank Lloyd Wright because th that was the organic principle. So he wrote a very brief response. So why don't you come see us uh, at Talias in West? This was written uh, on April 15 and uh, on May, I, I believe May the 8th, uh, Jaroslav Polivka already left for Talias in West for a week. So that was the first meeting which was very productive. This is a picture that was taken late, later. We don't really have that many pictures of Frank Lloyd Wright and Jaroslav Polivka either, uh, but we have like two or three. Uh, so this is one of them with William Wesley Peters, who was like the leading architect in Frank Lloyd Wright's office and also his uh, son-in-law. Uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright and Jaroslav Polivka during their excursion to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so Jaroslav Polivka stayed at Taliesin West. He loved the place because the site is really beautiful. Uh, in one of his letters, he called it the paradise on earth. And he stayed in these, what they call the shelters, which were built by the students as a master thesis. And they are still there. So he wanted to experience that. Uh, so he stayed in these shelters. And as you can see, he probably just woke up and he is wearing a bow tie. Uh, but anyway, uh, the first meeting at Stalias in West was very productive. Uh, they already started working on three projects because at that time, Frank Lloyd Wright was kind of struggling with the support of the spiral ramp for the Guggenheim Museum. So Jaroslav Polivka solved it, of course, because he was an experienced engineer. Uh, and this is the model uh, which was actually executed by Miloš Polivka for the ramp of the Guggenheim Museum. And these are the sketches and calculations of Jaroslav Polivka for the Guggenheim Museum. Then they started to work on the additional tower for the already existing headquarters for the uh, Johnson a company in Racine, Wisconsin, where Jaroslav Polivka was supposed to put the mushroom-shaped uh, concrete pillars on top of each other. So that was his task, and again, the tower is still standing. So that worked. And then they started to work on the Roger Laces Hotel. And if you remember when Ron uh, was talking about the Great Depression and that he got hired by the Thermolux company, he stayed grateful to the Thermolux company for the rest of his life that they employed him during the Great Depression. So he suggested that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually employs the Thermolux company uh, to do all these glass, like, like uh, the, 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 the shape uh, windows. And then uh, there was the second wave. There were like three waves of uh, cooperation with Frank Lloyd Wright. So first one started during the first meeting in 1946. The second one was in 1949. Uh, so in 1949, uh, um, Frank Lloyd Wright was already working on the project of the VC Morris shop in San Francisco. And VC Morris was very wealthy, was apparently doing very well, uh, I mean, financially. So he wanted this very extravagant cliff house, which was supposed to be on this cliff right here. Uh, and this is actually the picture taken by Jaroslav Polivka because he went to the site, uh, on the site and took pictures how the site looks like. 
And this right here is probably the only existing picture of V.C. Morris because apparently he was camera shy. We have pictures of his wife, but we don't have any pictures of him, so apparently this maybe this is V.C. Morris. But anyway, so this was the, this was the, uh, this was the design for the cliff house for V.C. Morris. And, uh, Yaroslav Polivka, Frank Lloyd Wright was again struggling with the structural design, so Yaroslav Polivka solved it. And then, in 1949, they started to work on the two crossings over the San Francisco Bay, which resulted into the huge, uh, concrete butterfly bay bridge. So, the original design actually was supposed to have an aluminum rotating piece right here, so the ships can go through. So the thing rotates, the aluminum part rotates, and the ships, the large cargo ships can go through. But they got rid of this part, and they came up with this design, where in the center it is higher, so the ships can go under, and there was a park in the center. So if you, because it takes like 20 minutes to cross the bay, so if you get tired, you can just stop in the middle and just go see the park. Uh, this is actually the, the, the whole plan of the, uh, of the, um, of the crossing. You can see that this is where the ships were supposed to go. And this actually originally was supposed to be floating, uh, fro floating, um, um, where the, where the, uh, where the airplanes land. Right. Uh, but then, Frank Lloyd Wright decided otherwise because it was taking too long and Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, very impatient. So, uh, he actually used this project of the Butterfly Bay Bridge for another project which he did in Baghdad, Iraq. He was supposed to design the whole city center. So, he moved the Butterfly Bay Bridge to this project and it's actually in there. And um, so, yeah, but Yaroslav Polivka didn't want to give up. So, he actually designed his own design for the bay crossing. This is the Northern bay, bay Crossing, and he teamed up with another engineer in San Francisco, uh, so they started to promote this idea. So, uh, so in 1958, they actually came up with this multiplication of the Podolsko Bridge, which Ron showed us before. Then, uh, we also know from one letter that Jaroslav Polivka did some unspecified work on the VC Morris shop itself in San Francisco, on the Maiden Lane, where you can see, again, the spiral ramp. Um, architectural historians say that it was Frank Lloyd Wright's training for the Guggenheim bio ramp. Then they took a break because Jaroslav Polivka, um, I don't want to go into details because there were many problems that piled up over the years. Uh, one of the reasons was that um, Jar Frank Lloyd Wright wanted the Butterfly Bay Bridge model back because Jaroslav Polivka uh, actually had it in his possessions. Uh, and uh, it was actually built by his students uh, in at Stanford, and yeah, Frank Lloyd Wright wanted it back, and then there was another issue with the, with the V.C. Morris uh, Cliff House, and then there was also an issue with money, because then uh, Jaroslav Polivka wanted money for his consultations for Frank Lloyd Wright, but uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually felt that actually it's Jaroslav Polivka who's supposed to pay him to just be in his presence. So, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright got mad, and they didn't speak for almost two years, more than two years. So there is like the br this break. It wasn't, if you read somewhere that it was a harmonious relationship, it was nothing but. But Yaroslav Polivka was very calm and very very relaxed and laid back man, so he uh, took all the Frank Lloyd Wright bullying, I guess. Uh, but then, in 1956, they started to speak again, and they started to design together again, and they designed these two projects, or I don't know what the nature of the cooperation with the Mile High building was, but they definitely worked on the racetrack pavilion, which I already uh, discussed how Jaroslav Polivka put these two inventions, put these two, these two patents together. And then there was supposed to be another project. In one of the letters uh, that were written, uh, one of the last letters between Jaroslav Polivka and Frank Lloyd Wright, Jaroslav Polivka mentions that he saw an opportunity to build a, pan a bridge over the Panama Canal. It was a project of the United States government, uh, which was paid by the United States government, and it was uh, it was um, uh, it was um, supposed to be this bridge over the Panama Canal at ba Balboa um, district in Panama City, and this is the final execution. But Jaroslav Polivka thought that maybe him and Frank Lloyd Wright could do the project together for this opportunity. But then Frank Lloyd Wright passed away and there was nothing came out of it. 
Um, so here, uh, and of course at the end of Frank Lloyd Wright's life, because he was quite very old when he passed away, it was apparently quite difficult to work with him, uh, because this is one of the last letters from Taliesin West from Yaroslav Polivka that says, uh, unfortunately Frank Lloyd Wright is getting mentally old, sometimes he contradicts himself, sometimes he says a nonsense. He's becoming senile, which is no surprise at his age of 87. This morning he completely changed the racetrack pavilion, so I have to start over. So this right here uh, is one of the only pictures that we have of Eduardo Toroja and Frank Lloyd Wright, and now I'm going to go into uh, how they met. They actually met through Jaroslav Polivka. This is a letter uh, when, in 1950, uh, Eduardo Toroja wanted to visit the United States and start his tour and promoting the Toroja Institute uh, abroad, um, where Jaroslav Polivka reminds to Frank Lloyd Wright uh, who Eduardo Toroja is and that he gave him the book at, during his last visit at Stalia Sin West and that he wants to come over. This is one of the letters that are going to be here at FedEx. Uh, there are actually about 20 letters uh, between Eduardo Toroja and Jaroslav Polivka uh, in Frank Lloyd Wright's archive at Avery Library in, in at Columbia University. So I drew this timeline. I'm not going to go into many details, but I want to point out one thing or one hypothesis. So there were like this was this was his first visit uh, at Taliesin West in 1950, uh, or to the United States in general. Then, of course, they exchanged some emails, uh, I mean, some, some letters, sorry. <laughs> of course, some, some letters. Uh, then, uh, they exchanged some letters in 1951, which, or, or, which was also regarding what they discussed during the visit. Then there was a break. And then there were more letters in 1953. And then there were more letters in 1955. And then, of course, at the end of their, 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 uh, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright's life, life, and of course, Jaroslav Polivka's life, and Eduardo Toroja's life, because they died, uh, quite close to each other, unfortunately. So, why did Frank Lloyd Wright contact Ed Eduardo Toroja, um, at, at the times? Because all the contacts were initiated by Frank Lloyd Wright, which was very unusual for Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, because he was a star, so people are supposed to come to him. So, he contacted Frank Lloyd, he contacted Eduardo Toroja, especially during the times when Polivka and Wright were not speaking. So they were not working on any projects together. And Jaroslav Polivka needed some experienced architectural designer, I mean structural designer, structural engineer, who he can con uh, confine with his project and who can consult his projects. So he was probably reaching to Eduardo Toroja thinking that maybe that's the guy because of course uh, of course, uh, they uh, they uh, understood what organic architecture me means. Um, so here, this right here, is um, how they were supposed to have a project together. Because remember when I mentioned the Panama Canal project, the Panama Canal Bridge, Jaroslav Polivka actually tried to pull Eduardo Toroja in the in the co collaboration, and he is mentioning. Uh, the project to Eduardo Toroja asking him if he wants to be part of it. Uh, up until now, I didn't think that there are any designs or any sketches of their proposal of the bridge, but there are. So this is the, uh, this is the design. Uh, we don't have anything else, sorry. Uh, this is the, the, the sketch on one of the letters from Jaroslav Polivka to Eduardo Toroja, uh, suggesting how the uh, Panama Canal bridge is supposed to look like. So, how did Jaroslav Polivka get to know Eduardo Toroja? So, we've read, we've uh, heard from Ramon that uh, they met uh, in Paris with Ramon E. Davis, who was actually one of the leading uh, people and of, uh, also leading engineers and managers at UC Berkeley in Paris in 1937. So, this is a letter, uh, and then, uh, sorry, 1947. 47. Uh, so then, uh, Ramon e. Davis was apparently impressed by Eduardo Toroja and came back to, to California and referred to Jaroslav Polivka about this great engineer he met in Paris. And Jaroslav Polivka was a man of action, so he wrote a letter to Eduardo Toroja introducing himself and uh, wanting 
to start some relationship. However, this letter stayed unanswered until Eduardo Toroja needed something. So in 1950, uh, when he was planning this tour to the United States, he contacted, Frank Lloyd, uh, he contacted Jaroslav Polivka if he could arrange, among other things, meeting with Frank Lloyd Wright. And again, Jaroslav Polivka was a man of action, so he started arranging it immediately, and he was successful. So this is one of the better known um, pictures of uh, the group in San Francisco. Uh, but again, I'm not going to show you a picture of Polivka with Toroha together. We don't have one. I'm going to show you one that's the closest as we can get. But here uh, we have the whole group. Eduardo Toroha, this is Elizabeth Kendall Thompson. This is Maria Polivka, uh, Polivka's wife, and uh, the other two men who accompanied, uh, who accompanied Toroha, which was... Um, Camille Nadal and uh, Francesco Lucini. So this is as close as we can get. This is Jaroslav Polivka's coat. And this is Eduardo Toroja. And of course, his wife. So, uh, this is probably on the way to Taliesin West. I believe that Elizabeth Kendall Thompson didn't join them, uh, to go to Taliesin West. Oh, and there is one mysterious man who also joined them, uh, which is P. Abea. Uh, who was a collaborator of Frank Lloyd Wright, and he was at the time working on the model for the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Uh, so he was in the in San Francisco Bay, and he joined this expedi expedition because they were going to Taliesin West. This is a very famous and notoriously 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 published picture of. Uh, not, this is this is pr probably Abea. It's not it's not Nadal or uh, anybody else. Uh, then there's Toroja, Elizabeth Kendall Thompson, and, uh, and Lucini. In front of the VC Morris shop that was built by Frank Lloyd Wright just a year before. And then, uh, there was a mutual exchange because after this visit to the United States, Eduardo Toroja invited, uh, Polivka and his wife to Spain. As far as we know, he was here at least twice, um, in Spain. And he got inspired by Spain because who wouldn't? So, uh, he got inspired by this beautiful, I believe, 15th century chapel, uh, which has these beautiful Gothic arches. And then, uh, because right after that, uh, right after he got back, he started working on these pre-stressed concrete Gothic arches, uh, in uh, the Chinese Methodist Church in Oakland. So, I believe that that was the direct inspiration because he literally just got back from Spain. And then they started to discuss the book. Uh, they started to discuss the philosophy of structures book, and the first question was, who is going to translate the manuscript from Spanish to English? So, Jaroslav Polivka, again, was a man of action, so he asked his boss, who was, uh, he was quite new, uh, at Stanford University, and his uh, boss, Victor K. Thompson, uh, was, um, again, a very Renaissance man, interested in arts, interested in history, of course, in interested in the history of structural design, so he agreed to actually translate the book from Spanish. Uh, he translated one chapter, and then he was probably too busy to continue, so he left the project. So then Jaroslav Polivka probably uh, agreed to translate the book himself, but he, need, he, he needed someone who will proofread his translation because English was not his native language, so he needed some native speaker uh, who, will, who will proofread his translation into English. So he went back to Elizabeth Kendall Thompson, which was lucky because she already met Toroja during his visit in 1950, and she knew who he was. And at that time, she uh, was quite boosting off her career in San Francisco Bay Area because uh, just a year before, he curated an exhibition, The Domestic Architecture, in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Arts, uh, which was like one of the first exhibitions showing or uh, suggesting that there is some distinctive style in San Francisco Bay Area in the mid-century modernism. And later on, she wrote this book, Houses of the West, which was supposed to confirm this, this thesis. Uh, and at the time, she actually started a Western edition of Architectural Records, which is a per period periodical which often gets forgotten, but there was also a Western edition, and she was the editor-in-chief of this uh, of this magazine. So, uh, they got in touch, and for about three, four years, 
she worked on the revisions and on the proofreading. But because, as Ramon said, it was not just a translation. They were, they were writing the, Toroha was writing the book as it was translated. And he was constantly changing it, and he was constantly uh, adding to it, and he was constantly revisiting the chapters that have already been uh, translated and that have already been proofread. So apparently she got tired of this, and she had two little children at the time, so she her time uh, was kind of limited. So she was tired of this, and then she said, I can't continue with you guys, uh, just um, have someone else do it. So she left the project in 1954. She tried to leave it. She was very polite. She tried to leave it several times, but Yaroslav Polivka apparently uh, made her go get back to the project. But then in 1954 she left, uh, and then, but Yaroslav Polivka uh, was uh, wanted to um, use any opportunity he got, so he contacted her again if she would publish, if she would consider publishing his two latest projects that were built in San Francisco uh, Bay Area. One was in Berkeley, one, the other one was in, uh, in Oakland, in Architectural Records, the Western Edition, which he didn't reply to, and it did, wasn't published. But he found, way, uh, he found another way to publish it. Uh, it was not just the book that they were discussing with Eduardo Toroja in 1950s. Uh, Jaroslav Polivka was also sending him some calculations of the project that he was working on, uh, and uh, he was sending him, they were just generally talking about what's new in the field. Uh, and for example, they were discussing this uh, alternative project of Jaroslav Polivka for the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. Because in 1952, there was a competition for the new Richmond San Rafael Bridge, which was steel construction. Um, so this right here, this is the original one from 1906, which was supposed to be replaced with this one, steel construction uh, another steel construction bridge. And this is Jaroslav Polivka's alternative design, which was supposed to save money and, of course, material. But there was a very strong steel lobby in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time, so they went with the less economical uh, design at, the, at that point. And he was telling all this to Eduardo Toroja because apparently he was very frustrated with it. So this is, this again right here, is... Um, is the original design, and this is the newly proposed design, and which we finally got from the designer Norman Raab. Uh, so back to the philosophy of structures. So they were looking for the publisher. Uh, so originally, they went to the Dutch publishing, which we already heard about, uh, regarding Eduardo Toroja's ambitions to publish on the East Coast. Uh, there was a New York-based New York company that was a publishing company, and they wanted them to publish the philosophy of structures book. It was kind of a long process, and Elizabeth Kendall Thompson also played part, some part of it, uh, some part in it. Uh, but after like two years of um, of correspondence, they refused the manuscript, thinking that nobody will be interested in the book. Uh, but the real reason at that point was probably that they were already uh, in touch with Toroja about the structures of Eduardo Toroja book, so they didn't want to you know, overflow the market with two Eduardo Toroja's books. And they wanted to get rid of the competition, so they were pretty harsh in the evaluation of the manuscript. But then, um, Frederick Langhorst came in the picture. Frederick, Frederick Langhorst, or Fred Langhorst, as they referred to him, uh, was Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentice who resided in San Francisco Bay Area. And Jaroslav Polivka actually helped designing the structural design for his own house in Berkeley Heights. And so they already knew each other from Taliesin West and from Frank Lloyd Wright's fellowship. And apparently, Jaroslav Polivka uh, told Frederick Langhorst that they are struggling with finding a publisher for this book. And Frederick Langhorst recommended this book for the University of California Press. So, in 1956, they were successful and they found a publisher. So nothing was in the way. These were the two editors with the UC Press who were working on the on the you know, proofreading and the edits uh, of the of the book. And here, this is the letter where uh, Jaroslav Polivka announces uh, the successful negotiation with the UC Press to Eduardo Taroja. Um, so then they made a schedule. This is the time schedule how they are going to proceed, and they were almost successful. But it didn't take that, that long 
uh, from then. This is the advertisement that was published. It was like a flyer where you could order the book uh, with the synopsis and who Eduardo Toroja was. It is just a piece of it. And uh, then I'm going to just mention a couple of aspects. First, there was the question of the title. Uh, how are we going to title this book that is still being pro in process and that is still still being in the process of writing? Uh, so Jaroslav Polivka suggested four different uh, four different titles. Uh, two of them were Philosophy of Structural Design, and the second one was Philosophy of Structures. Eduardo Toroja actually wanted Philosophy of Structural Design, and he was quite very persistent about that. But Jaroslav Polivka loved the philosophy of structures, because he considered himself to be the philosopher of structures. Uh, and uh, what was decisive was that the UC Press was also for for the philosophy of structures. So, okay, so Eduardo Toroja didn't uh, have his way with the title, but he demanded the picture uh, on the cover that Ramon discussed that will be uh, of the of the hip hippodrome to be published on the on the cover. About the graphic design, Jaroslav Polivka actually played also a part in the graphic design because he was very carefully selecting the pictures, the images for the book, which I will get into uh, in a bit. Uh, but he was also proposing some designs for the book. This is the front page, uh, not the title, but the front page of the of the book with the with the bridge, and you can see that it was executed according to his design. However. Uh, John B. Getz, who was like an employed graphic designer with the UC Press, uh, did the final design. Then there was the question of the foreword. This is my favorite story. Uh, so first they asked Frank Lloyd Wright, because who else would they ask, since they both knew him, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright respected both of them. So Frank Lloyd Wright only wrote this one sentence of the foreword. It was supposed to be just a note. It was Originally it was written by a pencil. Then his uh, his secretary uh, retyped it on a typewriter. Uh, we interested in engineering organic architecture in America have learned to keep a sharp lookout overseas for organic characters in the work of our contemporaries. We find it in France, in Italy, and now in Spain in the admirable work of Eduardo Taroja. And that was it. So of course they needed some longer foreword. They one page, maybe two pages. Um, so, and, um, you know, at that point, Frank Lloyd Wright was, uh, really already, uh, quite sick and uh, didn't really respond to, to any mail. So, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. So they asked another friend in common, Richard Neutra. Uh, Richard Neutra didn't write the introduction either. I don't know the reasons, uh, because there is no correspondence. But Richard Neutra was quite very, uh, quite very, um, excited about the book. And he wrote, uh, a very good review in uh, the AYA journal, which was published in Los Angeles, uh, two pages review, which is nothing but praise and nothing but positive. And he's also acknowledging Jaroslav Polivka's quite exceptional role in editing and putting the, the book together. So he publishes, sorry, so he publishes the Podolsko Bridge in the review. So they ask another friend in common. Bruno Zevi, uh, who was an Italian engineer and editor, uh, and also later a writer and theorist, uh, who was at the time an editor of L'Architectura magazine. And uh, Jaroslav Polivka was already in touch with him because L'Architectura magazine published Victor de Suvero's article about Polivka. So it all comes together. Um, before, so they asked Bruno Zevi, and Bruno Zevi also knew Frank Lloyd Wright because he visited Italia Sin West uh, a couple of times. So Bruno Zeve was supposed to write the introduction. He didn't do that either, uh, for reasons unknown. And uh, but he, we know that he was aware of the book and that he actually liked the book. So what did they do? They wrote the introduction by themselves. This is the introduction written by Jaroslav Polivka and Milos Polivka. The images. There were in the correspondence that are that is here now uh, at, uh, at FedEx. Um, there is a, a huge discussion about the images because Jaroslav Polivka wanted every image to be approved by Toroja, or, or he requested certain images from Toroja's institute. But also, since he was unsuccessful with Elizabeth Kendall Thompson to publish his recent work, he 
put his own work to the book, in, in, in the, into the book. And there are a couple of pages with, uh, with images that show Jaroslav Polivka's own work, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that are not in the Spanish version or any other language versions of the book. So here we have the Tioga building in Berkeley, which I showed you before. Then, of course, we have the Butterfly Bay Bridge, uh, joint projects of Jaroslav Polivka and Frank Lloyd Wright, which is also not in the, in the Spanish version of the book. Then uh, we have the Podolsko Bridge. That's why Richard Neutra published it, because it's published in the book. And then we have the Racetrack Pavilion, which only made, which is, I believe, the only image that made it to the Spanish version of the book. And then we have this interesting prototype of a, uh, of a uh, monolith concrete uh, ground floor and wooden uh, second floor, which was a building that he designed right across from his own house in Berkeley. So, uh, but Eduardo Toroja was okay with that. Uh, he asked about every single picture, if he can include it in the book of his own work, and Eduardo Toroja was completely fine with that. Uh, and uh, then the book was published by the end of 1958. So how successful was it? Was the Dutch publishing right about that nobody will be interested in it? Uh, it was quite very successful. Only in three months, they sold 1,200 copies, and they made quite a lot of money. Uh, they made uh, $1,300, uh, which, just so we have any idea what it means, uh, this is Jaroslav Polivka's taxes uh, return uh, from 1958, so the year before, and this is the amount he made uh, during the entire year. So when he got, when, when they meant, uh, when they when they made thirteen hundred dollars, it was more than half a year of salary. And then immediately they started discussion. Uh, discuss, they started to discuss other language versions. They started to discuss Japanese version, which is actually where they got the furthest because they even got a money advance for the translation of the of the of the book into Japanese. Uh, Eduardo Toroja was so generous that he said that um, to Jaroslav Polivka because he was the one who was managing and maintaining all this correspondence with all these other people all around the world, he said, that's just your accomplishment, keep all the money that you get from the Japanese version. However, it didn't happen. Uh, the structures of, it, of Eduardo Toroja were only translated into Japanese and published in Japan in 2002. So up until then, there were only a few people who knew about Eduardo Toroja in Japan. Then they started to talk about Italian version. Italian version... Uh, he, uh, Jaroslav Polivka started to discuss with Giorgio Neumann, uh, who was actually one of his longest friends, because they worked together while he was in Switzerland in 1913 and to 1916. Uh, he was one of his contractors. And then, again, they met again when they wanted to promote the uh, Leaning Tower in Pisa project in Italy. Uh, and then he asked him if it would, would be possible to translate the book into Italian. But that didn't happen either. Then, and this is how we learned that Jaroslav Polivka spoke C Croatian, because he asked uh, one of the leading engineers, actually he was resided in Belgrade, but he was, he was Croatian, and they were discussing Croatian version. Um, um, uh, this guy, Mijat Trojanovic, uh, who was supposed to, and he was very excited to translate the book into Croatian, which didn't happen either, and then in one of the letters, Jaroslav Polivka also mentions that there would that it would be possible to publish a Czech version, uh, that he is in touch it, it, with one of the architects in back in Czechoslovakia, and might, he might be interested in publishing the book in in Czech. We don't know who he was referring to. My only very wild guess is that it might have been Antonin Engel, who was a very um, successful architect. He was a teacher at Czech Technical University. And they were in touch with Jaroslav Polivka after the war. He was one, the, one of the, uh, I think, two architects that he was in touch with uh, after he emigrated to the United States. However, uh, however, Antonin Engel passed away in October 1958, so right before the English version was published. But that's just a wild guess. So why these magnificent uh, other language versions didn't happen? It was because Jaroslav Polivka passed away in February 1960. And as you 
know, Eduardo Toroja passed away the year after. But they had big plans, and their book was nothing but successful. So what I try to do here today, and I almost made it in the time limit, sorry. Uh, I try to show you this, just a part of this uh, very interesting and rich social network that was behind these great inventions and these great collaborations. And um, yeah, I think we should learn from them in a lot of ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ladislav, for this um, excellent framework of reference about Toroja, Poliska, his time, and their personal relationship. Thank you. Muy bien, pues con esta tercera jornada damos por cerrado el ciclo introductorio que nos ha situado en las figuras de Toroja, de Poliska, de su época, sus coetáneos y sus relaciones. Y a continuación vamos a disponer de eh, Aurea, diez minutos, directora, diez minutos de preguntas para estar un poquito en línea con el programa. Tenemos un micrófono, Monte, ¿verdad? Lo vamos pasando para que quiera, quien quiera iniciar. Eh, Suben los tres. Sí, please, eh, Ram. Ramón, muchas gracias. <laughs> ¿Alguna pregunta? Gracias, Carlos, ahí atrás. Eh, por favor, cuando vayan a formular las preguntas, preséntense con nombre, apellido y entidad a la que pertenecen para que los ponentes puedan situarse. ¿Perdón? Sí. Eh, hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Jorge Carlos Pacheco y yo trabajo aquí en el servicio de publicaciones del CEDEX. Yo quería preguntar solamente un par de preguntas a Ramón, al profesor Ramón Graus, eh, cuya exposición me ha parecido espléndida. Quería preguntarle eh, si puede darnos, puede ahondar un poquito más en la relación personal entre Von Castell y Eduardo Torroja. Y una segunda pregunta, una pregunta contrafáctica. Eh, ¿Qué hubiera pasado si esas fotografías no las hubiera hecho Von Castell? Quiero decir, ¿cómo hubiera, cómo habría sido la proyección internacional? de Eduardo Torroja sin esas fotografías en concreto. Muchísimas gracias. Lo, lo, a mí lo que me interesa es mostrar que Sibyl von Kaskel es acogida por, por un grupo de arquitectos e ingenieros que estaban, por ejemplo, publicando la revista Rec, que estaban en el centro informativo. Y, y esto yo pienso que se debería investigar desde el, el ámbito de que se está construyendo la ciudad universitaria. Y, y en ese momento la conjunción de fuerzas de, 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 de arquitectos e ingenieros que están renovando la arquitectura en Madrid en esos momentos está, allí, está en ese ambiente. Y ella, precisamente la exposición de fotografías que hace, que os enseño esta foto de, de Rafael Callalga, las, hace de, las publica dentro de un, del centro informativo de la construcción. Es decir, la acogen a ella y yo pienso que allí ella entra en contacto con Torroja, como con tantos otros arquitectos del momento en Madrid. Eh, a partir de aquí, bueno, digamos, yo pienso que tienen una relación que ya entiende lo que está haciendo el bar de Torroja y cómo es la arquitectura y se aproxima fotográficamente de una manera eh, nueva. Tampoco estamos descubriendo así el Von Castell, sí, Von Castell está, ha sido recopilada en exposiciones colectivas de, de, de fotografía contemporánea por Juan Naranjo uh, y por otras exposiciones uh, de los últimos 10 años. O sea, digamos, uh, a partir de aquí tampoco sé demasiadas cosas. Uh, yo os recomiendo que os leáis el libro de Covadonga Martínez, en la que ella intenta hacer una biografía de Sir Von Caskell. Ella está en París. Durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial, creo que se casa con un oficial allí. Después estará casada con un, un diplomático estadounidense de la, de la... No sé exactamente si de Nixon. Y volverá a, a vivir en Ibiza uh, los últimos años de su vida retirada. 
¿no? Entonces, bueno, es una persona que hace fotografías solo durante el, durante el periodo de los 30. Por tanto, no sé muchas cosas más. Y si la pregunta es, ¿qué hubiera pasado? Pues no, no, lo, no lo sabemos, ¿qué hubiera pasado? También había buenos fotógrafos aquí. También podría haber escogido algún otro fotógrafo que le hubiera hecho unas fotos similares. Lo que pasa es que ella tiene la capacidad de captar y de eso que se ve. Y además también hay una suerte añadida que es estas fotografías vistas en los años 50 hablan de otras cosas que interesan en los 50. Y eso era imprevisible. No sé si respondo mucho, pero... Gracias, Ramón. ¿Alguna pregunta más entre el público? Muy bien, pues si no hay más preguntas, vamos por concluir esta primera parte de la jornada y vamos a proceder a la formalización de la firma del acuerdo de donación entre la familia política y el propio CEDES, que viene precedida... ¿sí? que viene, viene precedida por dos, dos ponencias introductorias, una por parte del propio Ladislav y otra por parte de Isabel Rodríguez de, de Sotis. No sé si queréis subiros los dos de aquí y irás haciendo en paralelo las ponencias. Ladislav, además de, de ser el gran conocedor y biógrafo de Polivska, eh, como saben ustedes es amigo personal de la familia, y en consecuencia ha sido uno de los, de los encimas que ha gestado esta donación. Isabel Rodríguez es investigadora del CEOPU y es que tiene el mérito de haber buceado en todos los archivos para hacer esta precatalogación eh, inicial, inventariado, etc. Y tiene una primera visión de conjunto del alcance de estos documentos que va a poner a su disposición para suscitar sobre todo el interés, eh, el interés en que el mundo académico, el mundo investigador, etc. Eh, pueda impulsar el conocimiento alrededor de estos documentos que por supuesto estarán a disposición de todos ustedes con una filosofía como, como el matrimonio policía nos ha pedido, de acceso abierto y absolutamente gratuito. Eh, muchísimas gracias, Carlos, por estar Sorry if you didn't have enough of me, so I'm here again. Uh, but this will be short, I promise. Um, so I was asked uh, by FedEx and um, uh, we discussed it with Isabel that um, my role here uh, now would be to sort of show the other archives that include Jaroslav Josef Polivka and where you can, where you can, uh, get the archives, uh, archival documents regarding his life and work and also these collaborations and these networks and, uh, you probably start booking flights because it's all over the world. Um, so I believe that the first archival fund was actually the one at the Bancroft Library in, Ber in, in Berkeley, at UC Berkeley. Uh, then, in 1983, I believe the, there was the one established in Buffalo, at the uh, University at Buffalo. There's also another uh, another archival fund that is sort of um, dedicated to Jaroslav Josef Polivka, which is uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright's papers that are currently stored at Avery Library at Columbia University. Then there is FedEx, and then there is the National Technical Museum in Prague. No, sorry, that's the oldest one. Sorry, I got it mixed up. Uh, so I will start with the Bancroft Library. Uh, so this one uh, originally uh, contained a very miscellaneous stuff and it wasn't much of it. It was like only, I, I believe, five folders. So, uh, and how it ended up at Bancroft Library was that I believe in 1963, Polivka's wife was asked to borrow some of the archival documents regarding her late husband uh, for some exhibition at Bancroft Library and then it stayed there. So that's how the original fund was established. So most of it were publishing activities of Jaroslav Polivka in 1930s because he was not only, uh, not only helping the artists and supporting the artists and hiring the artists, but he was also publishing, uh, mostly, uh, mostly poems, but also some, some novels, but also most, almost mostly poems. And some of these books actually ended up at the Bancroft Library. So this is the plate which we already seen. And also there were some of the
publications that were written by Yaroslav Polivka in structural engineering, mostly related to steel constructions and concrete constructions. Uh, then, uh, after Ron's uh, and Victoria's generous gift, uh, because if you remember, uh, the 14 boxes were split into four archives, so after Ron's gener generous gift, uh, there were separated projects and documents that were specifically related to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is, and I saved it for now, which is actually Jaroslav Polivka's design for Frederick Langhorst house in Berkeley, which I discussed a minute, a minute ago, uh, which went to the Bancroft Library. And, of course, a lot of documentation regarding the Butterfly Bay Bridge, and also, I believe, plans for his own house on Arch Street, which I showed you that he acquired the Spanish-style home, and then he enlarged it and uh, added to it uh, in, a, in a big way. Then there is the Avery Library, which is not a, a special archive of Yaroslav Josef Polivka, but there is the most of the correspondence with Frank Lloyd Wright over the 13 years of their friendship. And also there are the projects that were kept by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, that were de co-designed by Yaroslav Polivka. So in this uh, in this fund, we can, we can find uh, 191 letters from Yaroslav Polivka to Frank Lloyd Wright and from Frank Lloyd Wright to Yaroslav Polivka. There are also a couple of letters that are addressed to Jean Masseling, who was Frank Lloyd Wright's secretary and assistant. And I believe that there are also, I think, two or three letters that are addressed to William Wesley Peters, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, first architect and son-in-law. Then there are also also these telegrams and also some copies of designs. There are no originals uh, in the correspondence fund. And there are also copies of some newspaper clippings. And then, of course, there are the joint projects, like the Racetrack Pavilion or the Mile High Building, Roger Lace's Hotel. And there are also some models uh, within the Avery Library, like the original model for the Guggenheim Museum. But if you want to look for the original model for the Butterfly Bay Bridge, you can't find it in any public institutions. It's actually private owned. Then, uh, after Yaroslav's uh, wife passed away in 1983, uh, the three children were deciding what to do with these uh, with these boxes and with this whole huge archive that Yaroslav Polivka uh, left behind. And actually, they originally thought that it should go to the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in Taliesin and Taliesin West. So their original offer was to Taliesin and Taliesin West. But at that point, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation was going through their own problems and they didn't want to deal with that, so they refused refused it. And uh, thanks to Katka Hemond, it uh, went to university at Buffalo Library. Uh, but they only wanted the stuff that is related to Frank Lloyd Wright. So up until recently, there were only four boxes of archival material, uh, which were strictly related to Frank Lloyd Wright. But it was a very various material. It, there, there, those, there were letters. So uh, up until nowadays, we know about something about almost 300 letters between Jaroslav Polivka and Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, what's not in Avery Library is is here, but there are also a lot of duplicates of what's in at Avery Library. There are a couple of postcards. Uh, then there are letters uh, from other people. For example, this is the only letter from VC Morris to Jaroslav Polivka, and he also inserted his business card, which is also very uh, nice graphic design. And then there are also again copies of some of the joint projects, but there are no originals. No original drawings or no original sketches, except for the calculations. There are a lot of calculations that even a lot of structural designers don't know what they are. So if you consider yourself to be a very strong structural engineer, you can go to Buffalo and uh, see what they are. Uh, then there are a lot of uh, magazines and newspaper clippings related, again, to Frank Lloyd Wright. There are mostly newspapers. Uh, there were, like, especially at the end of 1950s, when Frank Lloyd Wright was over 85, uh, all kind of magazines were doing special issues on Frank Lloyd Wright. So Jaroslav Polivka uh, was not just his collaborator, he was not just his friend, but he was also a huge fan. So, for example, Architecture Forum, House Beautiful, and many others. Uh, however, so those are the two boxes at University of Buffalo that contain the correspondence and the newspapers and magazines. And there are other two uh, boxes that contain actually something about 450 photographs. And those are the photographs, photographs that I mentioned 
uh, that Jaroslav Polivka uh, was a very passionate amateur photographer. Uh, he took his uh, camera everywhere, and especially to Taliesin West. So there are something about uh, three, 350 uh, black and white photographs and uh, something about 80 colored photographs, which are mostly from the end of 1950s. Uh, and because Taliesin West was growing quite organically and spontaneously, uh, because Frank Lloyd Wright was one morning, he just woke up and he was like, oh, let's add something here, and they didn't really do any plans. So it is actually kind of difficult to reconstruct the development of the Taliesin West Pride over the years. But thanks to the photographs that we have from Jaroslav Polivka, we can see how certain places changed or developed over the years. So, for example, this water tower, which was not there in 1946, was added in 1952, and then it was ch changed, and uh, again, there was stuff added to it in 1957. And there are many pl places at Taliesin West, and also there are some places at Taliesin West that Jaroslav Polivka photographed that no longer exist. So that's uh, really very, very helpful. Also, he photographed people that he met at Taliesin West, which is also very helpful to sort of see, again, the social networks behind that, and uh, also the excursions that they took. This is one of the excursions they took to the Baltimore Hotel, which was built in Arizona by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1924. So he took a group of people, uh, including Jaroslav Polivka, to see his then 30-plus years old project. And then there are also pictures of sites and projects that Jaroslav Polivka visited uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright that Jaroslav Polivka visited by himself. So, for example, this is the Langhorst, uh, in, uh, Langhorst, Frederick Langhorst house, uh, in, um, uh, no, sorry, this is a different house, but, uh, he also visited the Hanna house at Stanford campus and met the Hannas. And, of course, we have the many pictures of the site of the Cliff house. So, he also visited Frank Lloyd Wright sites by himself. Uh, and then there are, uh, and with Ron Ronald's donation, and that was the largest part of the donation because it was seven boxes of archival material. They got more pictures, they got more letters, and they got all kind of stuff related to either Frank Lloyd Wright or Jaroslav Polivka's solo career. Uh, plans, photographs, correspondence, everything. Then there's the National Technical Museum, which is actually the oldest uh, archive uh, of Jaroslav Polivka because it was established right after the Second World War. Because after the Second World War, they were given their possessions back, and especially the library, and uh, of course all the plans and all the stuff that he had in his office before the war stayed stayed in Prague. So Jaroslav Polivka was actually deciding what to do with it. He wanted to sell it, uh, but he decided to donate some of the books to the National Technical Library, and he decided to donate his projects and his correspondence to the National Technical Museum. So that was. Uh, which was which already existed at the time. So that was the first archival fund that was actually created by Polivka himself under the political circumstances. So originally it involves a couple of uh, projects. For example, this is the uh, state symbol for the New York Pavilion in 1939 for the World's Fair. There are also projects for the World's Fair. Uh, this is, for example, a brochure that was published by Jaroslav Polivka for the World's Fair in Paris in 1937. And then there are these notes. They are also very helpful because those are just uh, very brief notes that we can date from 1911 all the way to 19, I believe, 49. Or even uh, then, then he bought diaries and wrote these notes in, in, in diaries uh, up until uh, Jaroslav Polivka passed away. So we have thousands and thousands of diary entries all the way uh, spanning his entire career. Some of them are, per are personal, some of them are work-related, especially in 1930s uh, and at the end of 1920s when he was the busiest. Uh, then he just wrote, I'm going to Brno, I'm coming back from Brno. But that's also helpful because we can reconstruct how he moved around. And then there are also some of the, some of the sketches. Uh, so... With Ron's donation, we separated two boxes that are related to the Czech stuff and that are in Czech. So Ron uh, and Victoria donated uh, the Czech stuff uh, to the National Technical Museum. So it was, again, enlarged uh, with these two boxes. And then there is the uh, generous donation to FedEx with the 400 letters between Eduardo Taroha and uh, Jaroslav Polivka. Some of them are also addressed to Jaime Nadal. 
uh, some of them are addressed to other people. Uh, there is also the correspondence with Elizabeth Kendall Thompson involved. So uh, now, with thanks to Ron and Victoria and other members of the Politka family, it's here.